All right, so we will continue with the unknowns here. So take a look at this low power image on the left and then take a look at the image on the right. What do you think is going on here? What's your differential diagnosis based on this inflammatory pattern? So on the left, you see a superficial and mid periadnexal lymphocytic infiltrate, follicular plugging, maybe an atrophic epidermis, a little hy compact hyperorthokeratosis. On the right, you see a lymphocytic interface dermatitis. You might see widened spaces in between the collagen. This could represent increased mucin in between collagen bundles. So the diagnosis is discoid lupus. So clinically and histologically, you'll want to see hyperkeratosis with that follicular plugging and classic examples. You can appreciate areas that look to be thickened in terms of the basement membrane material with overlying basal vacuolar change, increased dermal mucin, and perivascular and periadnexal lymphocytic inflammation. Next case, how would you classify this inflammatory pattern? So hopefully by now you appreciate really good hyperplasia, and some people would call this psoriasiform hyperplasia. You'll notice that the distance between the top of the dermal papilla and the stratum corneum is quite thin. That's super papillary plate thinning. You have dilated vessels within the dermal papilla, many of which the lumen directly abut the basement membrane. You have hypogranulosis, overlying neutrophils in the stratum corneum. And in the dermis, you have just a mild perivascular lipocytic infiltrate, Abundant eosinophil should not be identified in classic examples of untreated psoriasis. So this is psoriasis. You'll want to see classically that layered perikeratosis, hypogranulosis, the thinning of the suprapapillary plates. You can see spongiform pustules in Monroe microabscesses. Perivascular and interstitial infiltrate of lymphocytes will often be seen in the upper part of the dermis, usually don't have a ton of inflammation, even in classic kind of psoriasis plaques like this. But when you see this pattern, you should have a differential diagnosis in mind, including fungal infections. So if you have a lot of neutrophils in the stratum corneum, you'll want to make sure that a fungal stain is done and it's negative. Mycosis fungoides can look like this. In this example, you don't see a lot of epidermotropic cells, so it's very low on the differential. Seborrheic dermatitis can look like a cross between psoriasiform dermatitis and spongiotic dermatitis. So depending on clinical scenario and location, usually with subderm, you do not get this very abundant psoriasiform hyperplasia where the reedy ridges are extending down in a club-shaped manner like this. And usually it won't have as much hypogranulosis as this in subderm. Syphilis, you do get elongated reedy ridges, but I'd expect to see more plasma cells in classic examples for test-taking purposes. Next case, what's the inflammatory pattern here? Or is this an inflammatory process? What if I told you it was a single lesion? Then what would you be thinking? So you'll probably pick up on this breaking in between the keratinocytes, so-called acantholysis. And you may be picking up on areas here of the premature um, production of keratin. So that's dyskeratosis. Maybe some areas that look like core rons and core grains. So this is a single lesion that's cup-shaped, a little bit endophytic with acantholysis and dyskeratosis. So warty dyskeratoma. It's usually solitary creatoform lesion with supra basilar clefting. You'll see centra, centrally densely packed laminated keratin forms, uh, and it forms a plug. You can see um, that there can be some areas where you don't have acantholysis, and the overall architecture is papillomatous. 
it can give this appearance of a villus pattern and you will appreciate core rods and grains, which you do see in Derrier's disease. So this is kind of like a localized form of acanthalysis and dyskeratosis. So it can look very similar to Derrier's. And in this biopsy, you can appreciate that it does look like a lesion. Um, usually Derrier's is going to be more widespread, but that being said, if you did not have a clinical of a single lesion, it would be a little hard to tell. Uh, because you can get widespread areas that look just like this in Derrier. So uh, hopefully they'll, they'll give you enough information on your question to be able to answer it. If they're asking both warty dyskeratoma versus Derrier's. But usually um, you'll have enough information either through a clinical vignette or just with the architecture of the lesion, it's a single lesion. For Derrier's, I'd expect them to put at least two areas of involvement within the slide itself to give you an idea it's not just one single lesion. Interestingly, these lesions have been shown to have an ATP2A2 defect, which is the same as Derrier. However, this was probably just a somatic mutation. Um, it's not a genodermatosis necessarily, but there is some dysfunction in the calcium pump. And remember, Derrier's calcium pump coded by the ATP2A2 gene is located in the endoplasmic reticulum. That is in contrast to Haley-Haley disease where the calcium pump that's defective by the ATP2C1 gene is located in the Golgi apparatus. All right, what's the inflammatory pattern in this case? You'll probably appreciate a nice collection of neutrophils right under the basement membrane. Here you can see a contiguous spread along the basement membrane. So it's not collected in a very neat microabscesses on the left. Here on the right, it looks like it could be neutrophilic microabscess. So what's your differential diagnosis for this? All right. Clinically, this patient was given vancomycin and they had a clinical lesion of the so-called crown and jewels where there was a bulla forming with little circular concentric bulla around a larger bulla. So this is linear IgA bullous dermatosis. It's a papillary dermal neutrophilic infiltrate forming neutrophilic microabscesses that look pretty much identical to dermatitis herpetiformis. So you have to have a little bit of uh, clinical correlation here. Now, as the name implies, the direct immunofluorescence here would show linear IgA along the basement membrane. Dermatitis herpetiformis, in contrast, would show granular IgA in the dermal papilla. You can see eosinophils in this case. That might help you remember that oftentimes this is a Fancy drug reaction, and it's most often associated with vancomycin, at least for test taking purposes. All right, next case. So on the left, it may be a little difficult to tell, but you do have um, a true bulla forming here. But on the right, it gives you a sense that it's it's not purely subepidermal. It's got this intraepidermal component because you still have some basal cells, basal layer cells that are connected pretty firmly still to the basement membrane. This pattern here is called tombstoning. So the buzzword should make you think about pemphigus vulgaris. So you'll want to see supra basilar clefting and acanthalysis. And remember that in contrast to Haley Haley, where you do get diffuse acanthalysis, in pemphigus vulgaris, it's going to usually extend into the adnexal epithelium. So think about pemphigus vulgaris being extremely vulgar, and it's so vulgar that it even affects the hair follicles. It won't leave the adnexal structures alone. Haley Haley's nicer and um, kind of spares the adnexal epithelium in classic cases. Remember also that pemphigus vulgaris will show you an intra or interepidermal. Um, network on DIF, where you have IgG. Remember, it's targeting desmoglein 3, which is located even in the 
lower parts of the epidermis. You can see minimal to moderate inflammation. You can appreciate mild eosinophilic exocytosis and spongiosis. You usually do not see core rons because pemphigus vulgaris is a problem with acantholysis. It's not a problem with dyskeratosis. That being said, that's why it can look so similar to Haley-Haley disease because Haley-Haley is a problem of acantholysis without much dyskeratosis. And this is all in contrast to Derrier's disease, which is, which is usually um, abundant acantholysis and dyskeratosis, as well as the warty dyskeratoma that we just discussed earlier. So this is an instant recognition photo on the right, tombstoning. And you can see it in Haley Haley and Pempigus vulgaris. However, this is a very clean tombstone pattern. Usually in Haley Haley, you will have stacking of the keratinocytes, and that's the so called dilapidated brick wall pattern for Haley Haley. You don't really see that here. That being said, you need some clinical information and direct immunofluorescence inflammation, uh, information to truly make the diagnosis in real life. So in Haley Haley, you're not going to expect a specific DIF finding in contrast to Pemphigus vulgaris, where you will find the interepidermal IgG pattern. So what's going on here? You notice a space right above the granular layer some stratum corneum, which has a basket weave pattern, some compact perikeratosis and more stratum corneum here. So this is a split right above the granular layer. And this is a very superficial bullous pattern. So pemphigus foliaceous affects desmoglein one. And that's why you're getting a split right above the granular layer. So it's subcorneal because it's right below the stratum corneum. Intragranular can be seen because you have desmoglein 1 expressed there. But you can also see upper epidermal collecting because desmoglein 1 is still enriched at the top of the epidermis. And it doesn't have a lot of desmoglein 3 to compensate when desmoglein 1 is, is kind of lost by the autoantibody interaction. Neutrophils can be seen evenly scattered, which is unlike in Pitigo, where they tend to collect. So the differential diagnosis for some type of um, subcorneal split here would be in Pitigo, staph scalded skin. Um, you can have just any uh, infection, superficial staph infection can destroy desmoglein 1. And so Usually with bacterial staph infection, like in Pitigo, you'll see a lot of organisms and you'll see neutrophils. This is a very clean split. So that signifies it's probably more of a pemphigus foliaceous autoimmune uh, process here. With staph scalded skin, it can also look pretty similar because staph scalded skin relies more on the exotoxin that's produced. And that's going to cleave desmoglein 1. And you don't, have to see a lot of inflammation with that either. So pemphigus foliaceous direct immunofluorescence will show you a superficial network of IgG targeting that desmoglein 1. Uh, again, you're going to want to go perilesional for any autoimmune process. You want to see perilesional skin because the antibodies are attached there, but they, yet, they haven't yet been consumed by the entire uh, antibody antigen interaction process. And so you can still detect nice fluorescence when you're directly testing for the presence of the antibodies. So what's going on here? You have some thickening of the epidermis, some irregular elongation of the reedy ridges. I want you to contrast this to the club-shaped, even club-shaped psoriasiform hyperplasia. This is not that even, and it's not really club-shaped. It's, it's kind of more of a um, <clears throat> uneven extension where you have 
thinning of the reedy ridges down further. It's not as even, and you've got, you know, wider reedy ridges as you go to the top. And conversely, you see that opposite um, shape and pattern in the dermal papilla. It's wider here and it's a little bit narrower there. Usually with psoriasiform hyperplasia, it's more even. So this isn't psoriasiform hyperplasia. The other thing is you've got really defined hypergranulosis. So you've got more granular layer than you'd expect. And you have overlying hyperorthokeratosis. So this is parigo nodularis or lichen simplex chronicus, depending on the clinical scenario. So if it's a big, large plaque clinically, and it's widespread even on the histology, then you'll think of it as lichen simplex chronicus. However, it's, if it's one solitary nodule or papule and the clinician was thinking SCC rule out, then of course it's going to be more in line with a parigo nodule. So you're going to want to see that hyperkeratosis, the hypergranulosis, the irregular elongation of the reedy ridges, papillary dermal fibrosis with that vertical orientation of the collagen bundles. So this, this almost looks like scarring below in the dermis because you've got vertically oriented vessels. You don't usually have, um, you can see some dilated vessels here, but it doesn't quite look like the psoriasiform dilated vessels, but it can look very similar. I mean, this lumen looks like it could be wanting to abut directly against the basement membrane. However, this is not as thin of a suprapapillary plate as you'd like to see in psoriasis as well. So if anyone ever was thinking psoriasis on this, it would be 100% wrong because it, it shows so many characteristics that are not consistent with psoriasis here. If they wanted to say chronic spongiotic dermatitis, that would be correct because like in simplex chronicus is essentially a chronic spongiotic dermatitis. And interestingly, the more chronic your spongiotic dermatitis is, the less edema you get in between the keratinocyte. The more hyperplasia you, you get because of the long time of compensating against all of the mechanical trauma, it's been able to thicken up quite well with not only a thick stratum corneum, but also a thick granular layer and a thick uh, total epidermis with the, with the fibrosis. So the dermis is also thickening up. So is this inflammatory or is this a neoplasm? So in both of these pictures, you should be able to appreciate a very well demarcated change on the left and the right side. And what happens is you get this abrupt change from normal appearing cytoplasm of the keratinocytes to a diffusely clear change in the cytoplasm. You have some hypogranulosis and overlying parakeratosis right there as well. And some of these papillary plates are super thin as well. So someone could even imagine that this looks like psoriasis in some settings. So this is a single lesion with abundant clear cell cytoplasm. This is a clear cell acanthoma. Sharp demarcation of the acanthotic epidermis is definitive for this diagnosis with the pale or clear cells that you can easily see the contrast from the normal epidermis and you may even be able to see some neutrophilic microabscesses in a perikeratotic scale, which looks a lot like psoriasis. You'll want to see decreased granular layer, which again looks like psoriasis. And you'll want to appreciate the mild lymphocytic infiltrate in the papillary dermis, which also looks like psoriasis. But in contrast to a seborrheic keratosis, you don't have horn cysts. Neutrophils may be present throughout the dermis as well. So, um, Hypothetically, they could put on a board exam, a digital slide, and it's just a shave biopsy, and you're, you're going to need to assess the entire epidermis and make sure that at the corner of the epidermis, you don't see an abrupt change there, um, a well-demarcated change, which would represent a clear cell acanthoma. So you may not get a, a picture-perfect symmetric slide on your exam. It may be, uh, they may be more expecting you to see the, the well demarcated area because in real life, you know, people shave these things off. They may enter in right here at the edge and you may not see it until you get to the other edge of the epidermis. These are really nice specimens for, for teaching purposes because they should show um, 
actually all the way down to the sub Q. So this is probably excision or excisional biopsy. All right, so on this picture, you, you have to kind of see what type of inflammatory cell predominates and what structure is it attacking. So you may have been able to tell that most of these are neutrophils and that this uninvolved portion looks like an eccrine gland. So this is neutrophilic eccrine hydranitis. You'll wanna see neutrophilic infiltrate in the reticular dermis within and around eccrine glands. It's similar to sweets although sweets does not usually affect the eccrine glands. That being said, um, sweets is so full of neutrophils that it would be hard to say that eccrine glands are not affected in sweets. But if you've got an, um, a picture of just eccrine glands that seem to be only affected by neutrophils, there's no way to say that it's not neutrophilic eccrine hydradenitis. And especially if the clinical suggests neutrophilic eccrine hydradenitis, then this would fit perfectly. So. Just a snapshot uh, diagnosis here. Is this an infl inflammatory process or a neopl neoplastic process? All right, so neoplastic and well circumscribed appears to be of what cell derivation here? So were you thinking neural cells? You were correct. Um, it, this could be on the trunk or proximal extremity, but it could be on the face here. Um, it's hard to tell exactly in this biopsy, but you've got this kind of demodex plugged follicle and some sebaceous glands here that probably on the face. All right. So what do you think? So this is a palisaded and encapsulated neuroma. It can be present very high in the dermis, maybe even um, a little bit into the sub Q here, as in this example. It looks like a schwannoma, where you might see some areas that look like varicae bodies, but it's not as defined as your normal varicae body. So here, it's hard to pick out any varicae bodies. It's just really kind of haphazard here, um, a mixture of random orientation of the neural cells everywhere. Um, they're not forming nice columns of palisading that you would want to see in a varicae body in a schwannoma. So this is probably one of the most definitive ways you can separate a schwannoma from the palisaded and encapsulated aroma is just the more haphazard arrangement as well as the location on the face. They're usually small and well circumscribed. They're nodular in terms of the architecture and they've got those spindle shaped cells with a wavy S shaped nuclei, um, depending on the orientation of the cut. You can also appreciate clefting between the fascicles, which could help you differentiate as well between a um, schwannoma and a PEN, as we call them for short. If you did an EMA stain, you can see an encapsulation by EMA positive perineural cells, which you can also see in schwannomas. But the uh, ratio between axons and schwann cells is usually about one to one here. So this looks to be neoplastic. We've got some wavy cells in here as well. They look neural in quality. So this is just your traditional neurofibroma. You've got some tiny nuclei, as they call it, um, because these cells are spindle shaped, depending on the cut and orientation, you may just get bits and pieces of nuclei. However, when you cut the um, cells more on a elongated orientation plane, you can see what some people call dolphin, swim, dolphin swimming in the ocean. Usually the background stroma has like a grayish to pinkish, it's a lighter color than your traditional collagen in many ways. And some people refer to that as bubblegum stroma, um, not to be confused with bubblegum collagen and keloids. This is just kind of a light pink to gray stroma in between that's, uh, the cells are kind of evenly distributed. And you may see some cells that look like uh, fried eggs as they call it on H&E. And it may be a little bit difficult to appreciate in this picture, but if you, if you get a neurofibroma 
digital slide, you want to go on high power and look for these uh, these centrally placed, very round nuclei with um, evenly spaced, lighter pink cytoplasm. And that's going to be your mast cell. And so for whatever reason that uh, I don't think we have a, a really good knowledge for exactly why there's tends, tends to be a, a good number of mast cells in your neurofibromas. Um, again, what are the stains that you'd want to do on this to confirm that this was a neurofibroma, if you weren't sure, because sometimes neurofibromas can look like DFs or dermatofibromas, depending on how much collagen trapping there appears to be and how pink the stroma is compared to how lightish pink gray they usually are. You'll want to do an S100 or a SOX10. I actually prefer SOX10. It just, it's cleaner and it'll stain these cells really nicely um, in neurofibroma, but will not stain obviously in dermatofibroma. The uh, mast cells are going to be CKIT positive or CD117 as another name. And you can have tryptase as well. That's another common mast cell marker. But again, that's not going to take up most of the cells in the neoplasm. It's going to be mostly SOX10 positive neural cells. Now, some neurofibromas will display uh, what is so-called Meissnerian differentiation, where you get the development of these corpuscle-like structures, also termed tactoid bodies over here to the right. That's not something that you'll probably end up seeing, though, on your classic board exam question. So you'll just want to have be able to recognize a neurofibroma when you see it on a digital slide, for sure. And you may be asked about the genodermatosis neurofibromatosis. All right, what do you think we've got going on here? We're kind of in a neural neuro, uh, neural neoplasm theme. So you've got some well demarcated neural structures. They on low power seem to be forming these fascicles separated by normal collagen. There's a little heart shape over here. Um, you always have to appreciate when you see the heart shapes in Durham path. All right, so what do you think is going on here? So this is a plexiform neurofibroma. So related to a neurofibroma, a plexiform neurofibroma is going to be ma made up of neural cells. However, you've got a larger lesion, the fascicles are larger, and they're separated out from each other on low power. So you'll end up getting this intradermal nodule of what is we call hypertrophied nerve bundles and sheets of spinal cells with a somewhat indistinct cytoplasm. It's hard to tell where one cell ends and another begins but the fascicles are more well delineated here. And you can see some areas that look like collagen trapping even um, where you've got just these clean bundles of collagen that are well demarcated from the neoplastic cells, not to be confused with collagen trapping that you're going to want to see in a dermatofibroma. So if there's ever any question, are you looking at a dermatofibroma or a neural neoplasm? That's when you're going to have to do your neural IHC. So SOX10 is a great one. And in this entity, uh, not surprisingly, you will see increased mast cells as well. It is obviously associated with neurofibromatosis. And if you've got a plexiform neurofibroma, you do have a chance. Uh, some publications and literature suggest at least a 10% chance of malignant change to a malignant nerve sheath tumor, a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor rather. And so um, when you do get these, it's probably a good idea to have a plastic surgeon or even a derm surgeon, depending on how big it is, um, remove it and send it off uh, for confirmation and to make sure that there's really no malignant change in these things, just um, because there is that risk. If you diagnose a plexiform neurofibroma in a patient who does not have neurofibromatosis known history, then making that diagnosis gives them the, the uh, diagnosis of neurofibromatosis. So plexiform neurofibroma is equal to having neurofibromatosis. So this picture is a little bit difficult to tell what cell type is involved, but I hope you appreciate the abundant 
superficial dermal edema here. And what if I were to tell you that most of the cells in the dermis were neutrophils? What would you be thinking? So this is sweet syndrome. You want to look for numerous neutrophils within the dermis. You'll want to see uh, areas that appear to have increased uh, superficial dermal muce, uh, I mean, edema rather. And it's, I will say that I've had a lot of examples in, in my career already, just my young career of rule out sweets and it's an ulcer and you've got a lot of neutrophils in the dermis. It's, it's hard to say once it's ulcerated that it's sweets because the first cell type that comes in to help heal an ulcer is neutrophils. And so neutrophils are a part of the normal acute inflammatory timeline of healing a skin wound. And so the best way to, to diagnose sweets on histology is to have an intact epidermis overlying it. So, you know, in those, when you have an ulcer, it's hard to say that sweets didn't cause the ulcer. Um, <clears throat> so biopsying an ulcer is, is difficult and you really have to go after a lesion that's not ulcerated first to see if you can catch the primary pathology. Once you get an ulcer, you can have secondary vasculitis, secondary vasculopathy, secondary infection. It becomes a mess in terms of trying to figure out what the true cause of the ulcer is. So um, for all of the clinicians out there, please try to diet or tr try to biopsy something that is not quite ulcerated um, if they're making new lesions, if that's at all possible. And now, of course, biopsying the ulcer is useful too, because you want to rule out infection within the ulcer and you want to try to still understand what the ulcer looks like histopathologically. But in terms of cause and effect, get the earlier lesions that have not ulcerated yet. So the differential diagnosis for tons of neutrophils in the dermis, you're going to obviously think about pyoderma gangrenosum. You can think about Bichette's. You can think about rheumatoid disease. It is often helpful to establish that the primary cell type in a non-ulcerated lesion is predominantly neutrophils, because that puts you into a different category of neutrophilic dermatoses. Neutrophilic dermatoses can be associated with many different things. Sweet syndrome, obviously, bowel-associated dermatitis and arthritis syndrome, so-called uh, badass syndrome. Many auto-inflammatory diseases are associated with abundant neutrophils as well. Uh, so familial Mediterranean fever, um, you can have the defects in TNF-alpha receptor, so-called TRAPS disease, deficiency of interleukin-1, so-called DIRA, you can have a hyper immunoglobulin disease or HIDS. There's so many things that you can include in your differential of abundant neutrophils there. Of course, infection is always in play. So you have to always rule out infection, not just with special stains, but with tissue culture as well. All right, so kind of sticking with the theme of abundant neutrophils here. So lots of neutrophils, but you may be able to appreciate in this picture uh, more of a areas of somewhat eosinophilic flame shaped architecture. And this is um, an interesting entity uh, known as Wells syndrome where you have diffuse mixed eosinophilic inflammation along with neutrophils and lymphoid cell infiltrate. So it's mixed for sure. Um, urticarial, um, usually these, uh, clinically these present as urticarial. And so the differential will, will include things like urticarial BP, drug, arthropod, scabies, um, Schurd-Strauss syndrome. Anytime you've got abundant eosinophils, it puts you into a different category. But <clears throat> usually what you'll see in so-called eosinophilic cellulitis or well syndrome is diffuse eosinophils and neutrophils, some areas of uh, dense eosinophilic uh, deposition along collagen, which is usually due to release of major basic protein from eosinophilic granules, and you'll get these so-called flame figures. So I would look at um, examples of flame figures in Elston and McKee and 
Whedon and all, all of the main Durham Path textbooks out there, as well as uh, watch some other YouTube videos that show you examples of flame figures because it can be a little bit difficult to appreciate. And some people just believe that Wells syndrome is a nonspecific uh, reaction pattern, and you can see it in many different types of inflammatory processes where you've got a lot of eosinophils. So, and I actually tend to believe that, um, you know, if you've got a lot of eosinophils around and they're degranulating, then you can definitely have some flame figures forming and um, to try to figure out the cause of that is, is the most important thing. So you can ultimately treat the patient. Um, but just be, be familiar with Wells syndrome as a diagnostic label that is given to a picture where you've got a lot of eosinophils that have degranulated and have kind of attached onto the collagen forming these flame figures. So along the same lines of the theme of neutrophilic inflammation, here you see some, it looks to be, I can't say it's perivascular up here on the upper left of the right hand side of this picture, because in this right panel, you see where you, you see this, you, you don't see the lumen here. And so you've got this perivascular leukocytoclastic process, maybe some fibrinoid destruction of the vessel wall can't really appreciate too much extravasated erythrocytes here. So this may be a little bit of a more evolved process. So this is a, a leukocytoclastic vasculitis because you do have destruction, fibrinoid necrosis of the outer vessel wall. It's hard to appreciate the lumen here. Um, so I remember sitting with the resident one time and we were laughing because I, I told her to find the lumen, find the, find me the lumen. I dare you um, in an LCD because it can be so difficult to really appreciate open blood vessels once all that destruction has happened. So you've got diffuse perivascular neutrophilic inflammation with leukocytoclasis and fibrinoid necrosis. There is some areas of extravasated red blood cells as you can appreciate here on the upper right part of this left panel. Um, and clinically, you'll see that palpable purpura, which gives such a classic clinical appearance that oftentimes when the clinician says rule out LCV, it often is LCV or it's a pigmented purpuric dermatosis where you do not get true neutrophilic inflammation. You do not get true fibrinoid necrosis in that entity of pigmented purpuric dermatosis. You usually just get capillaritis type reaction with lymphocytes mainly and extravasated red blood cells that is not usually to the extent of LCV or leukocytoclastic vasculitis. So if you do see abundant eosinophils in this process, you can think about enoch schonlein purpura. So you'd want to get a lesional DIF too to demonstrate vascular IgA deposition in henoch schonlein purpura. You can think about a vasculitis in the setting of allergy. You can think about a granulomatosis with polyangitis or schurg strauss syndrome, which is also granulomatosis with polyangitis and eosinophilia or eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. It goes by both names. The fibrin is pretty characteristic, but depending on what time point you biopsy LCV, you may not see a ton of fibrinoid necrosis. So you have to have a high degree of suspicion. If I see abundant perivascular neutrophilic inflammation, leukocytoclasis, and extravasated erythrocytes, and even just foci of beginning of fibrinoid necrosis, and I feel pretty good about calling it leukocytoclastic vasculitis, especially if the clinician is thinking that as well. Now, this says that lumens are usually open in leukocytoclastic vasculitis, and I agree that they, they are um, maintained open in many ways, but the uh, destruction, the fibrinoid necrosis of that outer vessel wall, along with the abundant neutrophils, when you're looking in the planes of section, it's difficult to appreciate the uh, cleanliness, I would say, of the lumen in normal sections. All right, so let's say you were given no clinical information whatsoever.
Where do you think this is on the body? It may be hard to tell, but you do have some areas that look like it had some dense follicular units here. So follicular osteo, you've got three right here in this section. The average number of uh, hylosebaceous units or follicular osteo that you should see on the scalp of a normal vertical section can be actually as high as 10, sometimes even more. Here, you do not see that many hair follicle units. You might see maybe a little uh, remnant of a regressed hair follicle here, a little stria. And some people may call these fiber streamers here. And here, these uh, retained follicular osteo have this dense lymphocytic inflammation around it. On higher power, you can notice and appreciate some interface change there. So lymphocytic interface change, this is kind of in the middle part of the hair follicle. So you can think it's probably at the level of the isthmus. Remember you, you can only see the hair follicles in the planes of section that, that you were looking at. So these likely extend further down and we're not really seeing the bulb of them. It's, it's inflammation. This is not bulbar inflammation. Okay. So this is at the level of probably the isthmus here. And so it's a, it looks to be a scarring alopecia because you have a pretty drastic decrease in the number of terminal hair follicles here in this biopsy. So this is lichen plano pilaris. You'll want to see in classic examples, follicular plugging. However, if it's more in stage, you may not actually get a robust follicular osteo to take a look at. You want to at least find some areas of lichenoid lymphocytic inflammation that should be around the follicular infundibulum, but can be um, located uh, as deep as the isthmus as well. Remember the infundibulum is higher up. Um, I usually remember that as it's fun to slide down a slide. And so infundibulum is the higher part of the, where the uh, epidermis curves down into it, but the isthmus can be affected as well. So infundibulum or isthmus I've seen affected in lichen plano pilaris. If you see peribulbar inflammation, you should be thinking more about a, an alopecia areata. And usually you'll see the peribulbar inflammation down in the antigen hair follicles. And you'll, you'll capture that more in the sub Q fat area. That's where you'll want to see the peribulbar inflammation in alopecia areata. Now with alopecia areata, you will not always see classic peribulbar inflammation depending on the biopsy. You may just see a shift from antigen to telogen in terms of the ratio. So you don't have a lot of antigen follicles, but you have a lot of telogen follicles. And that's all you see in, in alopecia areata sometimes. But remember, alopecia areata is a non-scarring alopecia. So you should still have a normal follicular density as much as possible. You'll also see wedge-shaped fibrosis in lichen plano pilaris which you would not see in an alopecia areata. So people refer to that peri um, follicular or wedge-shaped fibrosis where the hylosebaceous units used to be as a myxoid fibrosis. If you were to do a mucin stain, you would appreciate increased mucin within that myxoid fibrosis area. Usually um, lack of perivascular inflammation will help separate this from a scarring process like discoid lupus. So in discoid lupus, you'd expect to see a lot more inflammation in all compartments, perivascular, periannexal, et cetera. Here, this is more, the inflammation is really focused on the hair follicle. Clinically, you, you like to see perifollicular scaling in active areas of lichen plano pilaris. And here you can see why. I mean, you've got this hyperkeratosis, and um, that could explain the clinical scaling that you do see clinically um, next to hair follicles in the area of in involvement with erythema as well. This part of the biopsy would correspond to what would appear as scarring alopecia to us because we would not see the follicular osteo openings anymore. 
And so uh, putting together the clinic and the pathologic picture, you'd be able to make the diagnosis of lichen planus pylorus. If somebody biopsies a completely in-stage alopecia patch or plaque, then it is nearly impossible to say exactly what caused it. So if you really want to get the answer, you're going to have to biopsy an area of inflammation to get an idea. And it's helpful to biopsy an area that has at least some scarred process. So you can actually say, yes, there is a scarring component but also have the inflammation pattern give you more of a diagnostic accuracy to say it is lichen planus pilaris. If it's completely scarred, you're not entirely sure what, what it was. It could have been neutrophilic. It could have been, you know, like a folliculitis to Calvin's or um, acne keloidalis. Um, it could have been connective tissue disease related could be central centripetal cicatricial alopecia. It could be lichen planus pilaris. There's many things. It could even be trauma. So try to capture an area of inflammation. So this is not a single diagnosis, but more of a pattern of recognition. So I just want to emphasize here this type of inflammation. So you've got Vacular change along the basement membranes, areas of dying keratinocytes, apoptosis or necrosis of keratinocytes. It's not that inflammatory, but you've got some scattered lymphocytes here. The epidermis overall, though, just does not look very healthy. So this is your urethema multiform pattern of inflammation. Okay, so skip over the first two lines and go down to the urethema multiform and the third line here. This is kind of your classic picture of an erythema multiform type pattern. You get orthokeratosis overlying it, which suggests more of an acute process of inflammation, necrotic keratinocytes at all levels. So that dusky center clinically for erythema multiform corresponds to a full thickness necrotic keratinocyte uh, pathology. Now, if you have diffuse full thickness necrosis everywhere, then that puts you more in line with a toxic epidermal necrolysis or Stevens Johnson syndrome, depending on the level of clinical involvement. If you see a lot of uh, separation between the epidermis and the dermis, you can think about a bolus erythema multiform. You want to look laterally because the further away you get from the dusky center, the more classic, or at least the, uh, less amount of necrosis you're going to see. So the further away you get from the clinical dusky center, obviously the less epidermal necrosis you're going to see as well. Now, go back up to GVHD and think about, of course, it's not going to be GVHD in a patient without a history of a bone marrow transplant or a solid organ transplant. But if you have no clinical information, um, it would be sometimes hard to tell, is it EM versus GVHD? So in GVHD, you can see necrotic keratinocytes. And depending on what stage of GVHD, going from one to four, you're going to have increasing and increasing levels of necrosis of the epidermis to where in stage one GVHD, you may just have a scattered necrotic or apoptotic keratinocyte. Whereas in stage four, it, it becomes so abundant that you actually have bulla forming. So it's difficult to say without clinical, is it GVHD or is it EM? I do find though, the GVHD examples will have sparse inflammation for test taking purposes, whereas fixed drug will have much more inflammation, mixed inflammation with lymphocytes, histiocytes. You'll even want to see neutrophils and eosinophils in a fixed drug. Usually with EM, I don't think of it as having a ton of uh, eosinophils classically for board test taking purposes. You'll want to focus mainly on GVHD having basal vacuolar change, sparse inflammation, and scattered necrotic keratinocytes. Fixed drug, usually you're going to have abundant inflammation with some eosinophils. EM we talked about, and uh, SCLE or autoimmune connective tissue diseases in general, like cutaneous lupus, uh, whether it be uh, 
discoid or SCLE, you're going to want to see uh, interface change to this extent, basal vascular interface change. It's usually more involved than GVHD, and it's hugging more of the uh, lower portion of the epidermis. In connective tissue disease, you'll want to see perivascular and periadnexal inflammation. You'll want to see increased mucin, but the clinical is really going to be absolutely essential to put it together as an SCLE pattern or some autoimmune connective tissue disease pattern. Given the abundant uh, interface, vascular interface change, you can see colloid bodies and in SCLE, you'll probably appreciate an atrophic epidermis. However, you can see that in these other entities as well. So just be able to recognize that interface pattern. Um, usually on the test, they will give you things that are clearly separated. So you wouldn't confuse uh, because in real life, without any clinical information, it would be hard to make the diagnosis just based on basal vacuolar change in necrosis alone. So by process of elimination, if you see this pattern, you'll definitely want to entertain some of these diagnoses. And hopefully there's only one of them in the answer choice that would be much easier for you. You see abundant eosinophils, think about fixed drug. If you, if you see sparse inflammation without a lot of eosinophils, think about GVHD. If you see a central area of, of necrosis full thickness, and as you go to the edges, it nice evenly starts to decrease on your necrosis, think about EM. And if you've got increased mucin in the dermis along with this pattern, then you can think about SCLE. So here you've got some intraepidermal destruction of keratinocytes, maybe some areas that look to almost be like spongiotic change in a way. But you've got a serum containing crust here. It's a little subcorneal pustule almost. Some areas that look like neutrophilic microabscesses up in here. Maybe some, hard to tell, but maybe even some uh, viral cytopathic change in some of these areas with abundant eosinophils. And here, the, the key to this is, is recognizing eosinophils within the epidermis, as well as these kind of micro abscesses that are forming. So this is a um, picture of incontinentia pigmenti, which is usually defined as an epidermal hyperplasia with intraepidermal eosinophilic micro abscesses scattered dyskeratosis and melanophages. So remember, incontinentia pigmenti can look drastically different depending on which stage you biopsy it. Remember that this is a genodermatosis. It's a defect in the NF-kappa B signaling or the NEMO gene, which is a NF-kappa NF -kappa B uh, essential modulator. Um, so NEMO uh, mutation and you'll find that Blaschko's uh, lines are usually affected clinically. So you'll have incontinentia pigmenti. Um, stage one, you're gonna have more of a vesicular eruption. Stage two, it's gonna be more of a verrucous appearance. Stage three, they're gonna, the lesions are gonna become more hyperpigmented. And stage four, they're, they're gonna be more hypopigmented. But in this case, this, and the reason I mentioned these uh, intraepidermal vesicular like changes is because clinically they may even look like uh, herpetic because you've got these blisters forming, right? And so this would be more of your early stage incontinentia pigmenti with abundant eosinophils. So clinic uh, scenario is definitely going to guide you. But if you were given answer choices on an exam without any clinical, you'd have to definitely recognize the eosinophils here um, to be able to put you in the category of potentially incontinentia pigmenti. Now, seeing ab abundant eosinophils in the epidermis too, you can think about diffuse uh, eosinophilic spongiosis, which would include things like urticarial phase, <laughs> bolus pemphigoid as well. Speaking of eosinophils within a blister cavity, 
This is obviously more homogeneous in terms of the subepidermal bulla with the abundant eosinophils. So this is your classic bullous pemphigoid with a subepidermal blister containing eosinophils. You can have cell poor BP. The differential is gonna include arthropod, bullous arthropod or drug reactions. Remember you can have drug induced bullous pemphigoid. Uh, keep in mind that a direct immunofluorescence, perilesional direct immunofluorescence should show pretty good linear IgG and even impressive C3, linear C3. In bullous arthropod, you would not get that DIF pattern. So this is your classic bullous pemphigoid, and it's going to be absolutely crucial to recognize eosinophils within the infiltrate. I want to make a plug for an advantage of using, looking at glass slides on a microscope. So you can go on high power and use your fine focus to really appreciate the eosinophilic granules and eosinophils. One of the issues with digital dermatopathology is that it scans at one plane of focus. And so uh, it can be difficult sometimes to really separate out eosinophils versus neutrophils on digital derm path slides. Um, so usually you'll have to focus in on the fact that the nuclei of the eosinophilic cytoplasm cells are not polymorphonuclear. They're more of a round or bilobed nucleus, and that would help you separate out eosinophils versus neutrophils. Um, on digital slides, you can go on high power and pick up on the eosinophilic, uh, strong eosinophilic cytoplasm of eosinophils, and that should help you. Um, and usually there will be some cells that were in the right plane of focus that you can appreciate the granules on high power. So we saw a case similar to this in this earlier in this lecture where you've got these neutrophilic microabscesses right under the subepidermal space and the superficial dermal papilla. So it's not as confluent though as the example we showed before. So this is dermatitis repetiformis. You're going to want to see those subepidermal blisters with papillary dermal microabscesses. The dermis usually just has some mild perivascular inflammatory infiltrate. The differential, anytime you've got a subepidermal bulla with abundant neutrophils, should be linear IgA dermatosis and bullous lupus. So direct immunofluorescence for these three entities will show different findings. Dermatitis repetiformis will show you granular IgA in the dermal papilla. Linear IgA will show you linear IgA, and bullous lupus should show you more of a full house where you've got involvement with IgG, IgA, IgM, C3. Lupus is not always going to have your perfect full house DIF in real life, but for test taking purposes, they would probably tell you that information so you could get the diagnosis. Usually with bolus lupus, I see uh, even more drastic formation of a subepidermal bulla. It's not going to look like this, where you've got clean little microabscesses here. That being said, depending on how evolved the bulla is, you may um, have a hard time telling in a real life setting. Um, but this is this is often seen just at the periphery of a larger bulla in dermatitis herpetiformis. So going perilesionally for DIF is, will be key. And also even on H&E, where you're still seeing these neutrophilic microabscesses forming, but you still have areas that are connected in between those. So this is that picture snapshot recognition of dermatitis or pediformis. So in line with uh, the theme of bulla here, you have a very cell poor bulla, posse inflammatory bulla. You'll have eosinophilic collections on the upper portion of the bulla, so-called caterpillar bodies. You'll have this uh, festooning pattern of the dermal papilla, as they call it, where it's kind of extending up a little bit and floating almost like a, a plant at the bottom of the ocean. So this is your Porphyria cutanea tarda, instant recognition. Uh, so if this is on the, this looks like it's on the acral surface because you got a thick hyper orthokeratotic stratum cornea. So probably the dorsal hand where this was clinically. 
So to make the diagnosis, you'll want to see a subepidermal non-inflammatory blister with the stooning of the dermal papilla and caterpillar, pod, caterpillar bodies may be present on the blister roof, as I mentioned. This is the last case for this lecture. So here you've got complete obliteration of the architecture of the epidermis. So the epidermal cells are completely just blown apart by whatever the inflammatory process here. You see some ballooning degeneration. You see an acute orthokeratosis on top. So that suggests an acute inflammatory pattern. Over here to the right, on higher power, you've got some multinucleated giant cells, some margination of chromatin, some molding uh, of the cells together. So with the three Ms, you're going to be thinking about cutaneous herpes infection. So this is an intraepidermal blister extending through the basal layer to become subepidermal. You can see those multinucleated giant cells. These are the same giant cells that you're going to want to be looking for on a zinc smear. Mix inflammatory infiltrate. The uh, multinucleated giant cells often have this steel gray appearance to the nuclei. And as I mentioned, you'll want to look for marginization or margination of the nuclear chromatin and molding of the cells to each other, along with ballooning degeneration of the keratinocytes. This definitely will show up on your board exam because it's something that needs to be recognized on dermatopathology um, to be able to make sure the patient has the proper diagnosis of herpes infection. You might see this in uh, eczema herpeticum in a patient that's got um, diffuse background atopic dermatitis and doing a biopsy such as this. Seeing the viral uh, features, the viral cytopathic features will allow the patient to get the proper diagnosis and um, the life-saving treatment that they would need. So that is it for this uh, set, and we will continue on with more in the next lecture.